Hey, we're Phil and Meredith, and we're the pastors here at Cornerstone Church, and we are so glad that you are here with us today. It's our prayer that this message is an inspiration to you, that it builds you up, that it stirs your faith right now in your today, as well as in the days to come. We believe that God has great things for you. God bless you. The worst standoff I ever had in all of my adolescent years was over being able to say the phrase, I didn't know that, I was wrong. I would not say it, even in the fact of sheer, I think I was like 15, 16 years old, and I had a standoff in our kitchen with my dad because he showed to me evidence about something that I did not know and I was convinced of, and I still refused to utter the words, thanks for that new information, I didn't know that previously all out standoff. Now, in God's great wisdom, he has sent me one in the same, and I have a four-year-old who insists that he knows more about the world than not only his parents, but his grandparents, his aunts, his uncles, his new bless her heart preschool teacher at school. This child is so confident of the things that he knows. So we are trying to teach him the phrase, I didn't know that. Because he will look at you and say, I know. I'm like, you don't know. I know you don't know because I just told you for the very first time. And he's like, mm-mm, I knew that. It is so bad that this past weekend, he has this little car that is from the show Cars and it's an Italian racer car. And he thinks that he knows how the name of this Italian racer car is pronounced, even though he is not Italian, does not speak Italian, and has never been to the country of Italy. However, good news, we have a brother and sister-in-law who live in Italy. They are, she is Italian, and they live in Italy and have been living there for several years. So I said, I will solve this problem easy peasy. I'm going to FaceTime your Auntie Beck, and we are going to get to the bottom of how this car's name is intended to be pronounced. And he said, fine, call her. He's so sassy. Where does this child get this sass? My goodness. I wish I could say it came from somewhere else. Man, he gets it honest. So we call his auntie Beck, and she says, actually, Theo, you are incorrect in the way that you're pronouncing the name. Your mom was right. This is how you pronounce the name. And he goes, no, that's not how you say it. <sighs> and I looked ahead to my teenage years with my son, and I saw a reversal of the same scene that I put my parents through, nose to nose, trying to tell him and teach him to say the phrase, I didn't know that. The reason I want him to learn to say the phrase, I didn't know that, is not because I want to continually beat into my child that he is occasionally wrong, but because it's important to know that you can take in new information and say, oh, I thought that before, but now I have new information, and I didn't know that before. Now I know something that I did not previously know. And while maybe I can't get him to say it, I'm hoping that if I say it enough times this morning, I can get all of you to say it. Say, I didn't know that. <laughs> One of the things that I didn't know is I didn't know that my prayers were powerful. Why don't you look at somebody next to you and say, I didn't know that my prayers could do that. Sometimes it seems like there are certain prayers that we pray in life and we expect that probably that's within the realm of what God did. But why I wanted us to talk about who God was for the last month and then step into some time talking about our prayers is because we have to understand just who God is, how big he is, how grand he is, what his heart, what his core is. Then, then we can step into an understanding of just how powerful our prayers can be be when we partner with God. What I want to do today is I want to spend a little bit of our time together, and I want your hearts to be stirred for how powerful your prayers can be. Not the prayers of somebody else, not how powerful it is just to pray corporately. There's something incredibly meaningful about our corporate prayers, but how powerful your prayers are. Yes, you, teenager, who is trying to figure out your identity in a social media world, your prayers are powerful. 
to the 20 year olds who are trying to build the foundation of what their life is gonna look like. Your, pow- your prayers are powerful. If you're in your 30s and 40s and you're trying to squeeze the most out of your life building years, your prayers are powerful. If you're in your 50s and 60s trying to reimagine what a second half of your life looks like, your prayers are powerful. If you are in your 70s and 80s and you are pushing back on what culture tells you that you your last decades are supposed to look like, but you know that you are full of wisdom and that these are your best sowing years yet. Your prayers are powerful. And if in you're in your 90s and almost in your 100s, you probably do not need me to tell you, you have already figured out that your prayers are powerful. But I want us to know before we leave here without a shadow of a doubt and have our hearts stirred in a new way that our prayers are powerful. James 5 and 16 says it this way. It says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Powerful and effective. Who wants some prayers like that? Some prayers that are powerful and effective. Yeah, not you. Somebody like at home was like, yeah, I really like it when I go to pray and I feel like I've wasted my time all day. No, no one wants that. Everyone wants prayers that come straight into the throne room of heaven that connect with God, that cause things on earth to shift and to move and to align with God's purpose. We want prayers in our lives, in our church, in our family that are powerful and effective. We're gonna spend the first 10 days of the next few months, the last months of this year, October, November, and December, we are gonna spend the first through the 10th in some prayers of dedication. Because we believe there's something meaningful about the first things, and we're gonna take those first 10 days and we're gonna dedicate that time. We're gonna dedicate our hearts. We're gonna dedicate our prayers, and we are gonna dedicate our next decade to God in those times of prayer. And that's why I want us to spend the next couple weeks as we lean into that, focusing our hearts and our minds around what it means to have powerful prayers. So we can step into that time expecting something from God. Not just walking into it to go through routine prayers, but expecting that we have powerful and effective prayers. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you that you have given us the power of prayer to partner with you in heaven. I ask you to help me speak clearly today, to give us ears to hear what you are saying, spirits that are ready to receive, Father God. And we ask above all that what happens right here in these next few moments would change us and form us and make us more like you, Jesus, and prepare us for the days ahead. In your mighty name, amen. So the prayers we want to pray are powerful and effective, but have you ever prayed prayers that are kind of silly prayers? I have. Prayers like, dear God, please, when I get to the buffet, let there be chocolate cake left at that buffet. (laughs) Prayers about, you know, just the silly little things in our life. When we pray prayers like, sweet baby Jesus, please help me pass this exam even though I didn't study for it, not one bit, not even a smidgen at all. God, if you would help me pass this exam. Because sometimes we treat our prayers a little bit more like it's a draw from the Monopoly card pile than it is a powerful and effective prayer. And we're like, hey God, what I really could use right now is a draw for some property on Pennsylvania Avenue and a get out of jail free card for what's going on in my life right now. We don't really step into the place of prayer with an an urgency and a belief that God is going to change and affect what's going on in our lives. Instead, we say if we're having a good day, we pray, God, let today last forever. And then if we're having a bad day, suddenly we are a scholar in eschatology and we're like, God, it looks like a great day for you to return. I feel like my spirit and my heart are ready. Just come now, Lord, and take us Away. We pray prayers sometimes that are a little bit silly. But there's this guy, Joshua, who prayed a prayer that seemed like a silly prayer 
except for Joshua was not playing around about his prayer at all. Joshua was as serious as you can get when he asked God to make the sun stand still. He prayed a bold, powerful prayer with no sense of jest, with no sense of levity in it at all. He asked God to hold the sun still in the sky. Why don't you turn with me to Joshua 10, and we're going to start in verse 12. Joshua comes to this place where he is in the midst of a battle, and he is asking God to do something on his behalf. Joshua 10 and 12 says, At the time Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. And is it not written in the book of Jashar that the sun stopped in the midst of the heavens and did not hurry to set for about the whole day? There has never been a day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel." Joshua asked God to hold the sun still in its place, and God heeded what he had said. There are prayers in our lives that command the attention of heaven, that draw God's attention to us, and that cause God to move on our behalf. Joshua understood what it was not to pray silly prayers for small things in his life, but to pray prayers that were powerful and effective and that commanded the attention of heaven. When I was reading back through this portion of scripture in my Bible, in my physical Bible, um, I felt like God was drawing me to this passage for this weekend, and so I started reading it and going back through it, and I had written previously, and another time that I was reading through it, in the side margin, I had circled this section and wrote, what got into Joshua? Like, have you ever prayed a prayer and found yourself and gone, whoo, what got into me? right there. The Holy Spirit just came up and prayed that prayer because it was powerful and effective. There was something that got into Joshua in the midst of that battle that just commanded heaven to stand on alert and say, I'll honor that prayer right there. But what got Joshua here? You have to know about Joshua, that Joshua is the leader that took over leading the children of Israel after Moses had departed from them. And here comes Joshua, and he has been waiting for 40 years for his assignment. His assignment is to lead the children of Israel into their promised land. Now, if you remember your Bible history, you remember that Joshua thought they could take the land the first time. He and Caleb thought they could take it, but instead he had to wander around the desert and wait until God said, now is the time for you to go up and take the promised land. And Joshua is ready. He is ready to go. He is ready to get into that promised land, and he is not playing, and he is not taking any lip from the people of Israel about it. He heard how they murmured the first time. He heard how they complained the first time, and he said, oh, no, we are taking this promised land. And they start off strong with the Battle of Jericho. Even if you're not familiar with church, you've probably or potentially heard a story about these people who marched around walls and then had a praise so strong, so loud, so rowdy that it caused the walls of Jericho to fall down. And they're feeling strong and they know that God is on their side and their enemies are starting to hear about how Joshua is now leading the people of Israel to take over their promised land. God And Joshua hears from God again, and they take on this battle at a place called Ai, and they take it on, and it seems like God is on their side because they overcome, and they do what God told them to do, and then something is not quite right, and Joshua finds out that someone on his crew, one of his guys back in their their tents, has stolen out of God's uh, portion that was supposed to be turned entirely over to him, and now Joshua has to deal with what he's 
going to do about this situation. And he is devastated because he is ready to take the land. And he cannot believe that someone would do something that would prohibit them from taking the land after they have been waiting for it for 40 years. So Joshua handles that situation and he's dealing with it and he's cleaning up everything that had to happen after they come out of AI and he's getting the people back in alignment with the word of God. And while that's going on, the people of Gibeon come to Joshua and they disguise themselves like they are somebody else and they trick him into making this treaty with them that says that he won't attack them and he won't overcome them and that he'll make a treaty with them and they can kind of like all live together. And the thing that Joshua missed to do is that he didn't seek God before he made this treaty with Gibeon. He was distracted by everything that he just had to deal with. And he was in turmoil about everything. And while he was in the fluster of handling everything that was going on, all of a sudden the people of Gibeon come to him and Joshua makes a decision about what they need to do without turning and consulting God. I don't know if in the middle of this year with everything going on and all of the things that are pulling at your attention and causing you to make decisions, you feel like a decision has come at you that you're not quite exactly sure how to handle. But if you have found yourself in that moment, I want to encourage you to pause for a second. And don't forget to consult God before you make the decision. Because you might end up tying yourself to something. You might end up tangling yourself in something. You might end up making an agreement and a treaty with something that God never intended for you to be partnering with, but always intended for you to be overcoming, just like Joshua. But instead, Joshua finds himself in this moment where he has made a partnership with the people of Gibeon. And thankfully, we serve a good God who is great and who is merciful and says, I can still see your plan come to pass and and bring you into your promised land despite this. Joshua gets back on track. But this is what his partnership with Gibeon did. His partnership with Gibeon brought a battle to him that wasn't actually his. Because when the people of Gibeon came out and said that they had made a treaty with Joshua, it made all the other kings of the territories very upset. They were not happy that the people of Gibeon would go and make this treaty because they knew that it was, it was putting a different kind of precedent out in, in what was supposed to be coming against Joshua. And so five kings united together and then came up to attack Gibeon because they knew that it would draw Joshua and the children of Israel into the battle because they had made this treaty. And Gibeon sends word to Joshua and says, honor your treaty. We have been, we have, we are coming under attack. Please come and honor the treaty that you have made with us. And that is how Joshua finds himself in this battle that isn't even his battle. Fighting on behalf of someone that he has partnered himself with. But this time, he has learned his lesson. And before they go up, he consults God and he says, should we go up? God, what's going to happen here? And God says, don't be afraid. Don't worry about it. I'm on your side and you will surely overcome. And I love about Joshua that it says, then he went, let's go then. Joshua is one of those guys that once he's heard from God, once he knows he can conquer, there's not a lot of hesitation in him. He is ready to move forward. And all of that brings Joshua to this moment where he's standing in the middle of a battle and has the crazy, wild, radical, audacious prayer to say, God, hold the sun still in that spot and hold the moon still in that spot because we are in the middle of a battle. I want prayers like that. Prayers that in the midst of a situation, a faith rises up in me that causes the attention of heaven to say, I'll move on behalf of that people. Prayers that rise up in me and call all of heaven to say, let's move all of our forces behind that situation right there. Because there is such a strength, a boldness, a confidence that God has called us to partner with him in prayer. 
And there Joshua is in this moment fighting this battle with this crazy, audacious prayer. What is it about his crazy, audacious prayer that causes heaven to stand at attention? I believe part of what caused heaven to stand at attention is that Joshua's prayer was a prayer that came out of a place of integrity. See, Joshua didn't have to come and fight this battle. They weren't attacking Joshua and the people of Israel. They were attacking the people of Gibeon. And Joshua had made a treaty with the people of Gibeon. But let's be honest, he didn't have to honor his treaty especially after he realized this is a treaty I should not have gotten myself into in the first place. He didn't have to do that because we always have a choice whether or not we're going to walk in integrity. But instead, Joshua said, I have made this treaty with these people. I gave them my word. I made a covenant with them. And out of my integrity, I have to walk out this path. And I have to follow through on the thing that I said that I was going to do. Don't ever fool yourself into making statements about what you have to do and what you don't have to do. You always have the choice about whether or not you're going to walk in integrity. And too often throughout our weeks, we like to pass our decisions off on someone else like we're out of control of our lives, like we're out of control of the decisions that we're making, like we're out of control about whether or not we're going to stand in integrity in a moment. Well, I had to make that deal because my boss told me that that's the deal that they wanted me to make. Well, I I had to present that information in that way because if I didn't be a little bit deceitful about the way that I presented that information, then they might not let me get the, the, the job that I wanted to have in this moment. You didn't have to do anything. You chose to value your relationship with your boss over your integrity. You chose to value that potential promotion over your integrity. You chose to value an open door that you were opening with your hand, not through the hand of God, over your integrity. But if we're going to have prayers that demand the attention of heaven, we have to be people of integrity who say our yes is yes and our no is no. If this is what is within the perfect will of God, then this is the place that I will stand from and the chips have to fall where they might because I will stand in integrity even when it meant going into a battle that he didn't want to go into, a battle that wasn't his, Joshua was a person of integrity that said, I gave my word. Therefore, I'm going to walk in the, in the path of integrity, and I will come and stand beside Gibeon in this battle. Joshua's prayer was a prayer that was connected to his word from God. Joshua didn't pray something that was out here that he thought was out of the will of God. He didn't pray a prayer that tried to change the heart of God. He didn't pray a prayer that was in opposition to what he had heard from God. He prayed a prayer that he knew was in line with what God had said to him. God said to him in verse 8, Do not be afraid of them, for I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. So Joshua said, if I know that not one of them will be able to withstand me, if I know that you have given this battle into my hand, God, then let me pray a prayer that is in alignment with that. When we pray powerful prayers that connect to the heart of God, we're praying prayers that we know connect with the word of God. What have you heard God say in this season? What is God speaking over your family? Have you slowed down enough to listen and say, God, what are you saying about this situation? Have you taken enough time to get in your word and say, God, I don't understand what's happening right here and right now, so let me get in your word and find out what your word says about what's happening right here and right now. Because powerful prayers connect us with the word of God with what he's speaking over our lives, with what he has written in his word, and they line up with that, and then they call the attention of heaven. 
We're going to spend some time next week talking about what it means to hear from God, what it means to listen in prayer, and to have prayers that then line up with what we are hearing from God. But Joshua's prayer was a prayer that connected with the thing that he had heard from God. Joshua's prayer was connected with his action. Joshua didn't pray a passive prayer and then wait for God to do something. Joshua prayed a prayer that he was in action about. If I'm honest, this is the one I struggle with sometimes. I want to pray prayers where I sit back and I say, God, I'm going to hang out right here, and that looks like a mess, so if you could sort that out while I wait on the outside, that would be awesome. God, if you could do that, I would really appreciate it. I sit and I wait for God to do something without my participation in it. But all throughout scripture, we find out that for some reason, it is God's delight to partner with human beings to see his plan and his purpose come to pass in the earth. For some reason, he has chosen you and I to be his weapons right here in the here and the now, to go out and act on his behalf. And Joshua understood this. When he heard the word from God, it says suddenly, immediately, quickly, whatever translation you're looking at, they got up and they marched all night long to get at that battle. And then they engaged in the battle that God had called them to. It's not how I want my prayers to work. I really, I want to treat my prayers like I treat Alexa and I want to request something and then I want it to show up on my doorstep in 48 hours or less, right? That's how I treat my prayer life. And when it doesn't show up in 48 hours or less, I'm like, God, are you sending it through the postal service? Because it seems like it's delayed today. I'd like it to be here, FedEx quickly. Where is my special delivery of my prayer that I'm sitting on my couch praying and waiting for? But Alexa is designed to make my life easier, happier, and simpler. God did not send you and I into the world simply to make our lives easier, happier, and simpler. God is more concerned with refining us and making us look more like him. So he said, I need you to get up off the couch and I need you to get engaged in your community. I need you to get engaged in your city. I need you to get engaged in your church. I need you to pray powerful prayers that are connected to the actions that you have. Why are you sitting in your living room praying every day that your neighbor would get saved and you haven't walked over there and said hi to them in more than a week? God is not going to send fairy dust down and make them magically wake up one day and say, I'm going to ask Jesus to come into my heart. He positioned you next to them on purpose and said, I have a prayer for you. I have a place for you and I have an action for you. So let's get engaged. Powerful prayers call the attention of God when they are connected to our action. While Joshua was in battle, he cried out to God in prayer and said, God caused the sun to stand still. I'm out here and I'm working, God. I'm out here and I've put my hand to the sword, God. I'm out here and I'm plowing in the field, God. I'm out here and I'm walking in my community, God. I'm out here and I'm showing up every day for these kids, God. I'm out here and I'm having the hard conversations, God. So while I'm here in this moment working and in action, God, would you cause the sun to stand still and suddenly heaven says, I can partner with that moment right there. There are powerful prayers. Joshua's prayer was specific. He didn't just say, God, we could use some help. However that works out for you. Joshua had a specific prayer. He said, over there, over Gibeon, make the sun stand still. And over there, over the valley, make the moon stand still, God. It was a specific prayer. And the reason it was a specific prayer is because when it's specific and it happens, there's no question that God moved on their behalf. That Joshua called out. Joshua had like the original smart goals prayers. He said, I have a specific request of you, God. Not just that you would kind of show up, but that you would show up right here and right now. 
that God would move in this way. I wanna encourage you to get specific with your prayers. Sit down and write down exactly what you are asking from God. Sit down and write it out so that when he moves on your behalf, you can look back and say, this is the thing that I asked God for and that is the proof and the evidence of what God did in my life. Powerful prayers are specific. And you know what I think keeps us from praying powerful prayers, some, powerfully specific pr- prayers sometimes? I th- thanks, babe. Question back. I think we, <laughs> we don't pray them because we're afraid of what it might mean if God doesn't actually do them. If I get that specific with my prayers and I don't see the result, then what does that mean? And so I pray safe prayers that can kind of cover a lot of things, like, God, won't you be with me today? And yes, I want him to be with me today, but how do I know if he was with me or if he wasn't with me today? But if you pray specific prayers and God shows up on your behalf, it stirs your faith and it gives you a living testimony that says that is the thing that God did in my life. Like Hannah when she said, God, give me a child and I'll give him back to you. And that child showed up. She didn't have to say, I'm pretty sure God's been with me over the last little bit. She said, oh no, I know that God heard my prayer. Come with me, let me show you the child who is serving in his house. Pray specific prayers. Because the ultimate reason that I believe God turned and listened to Joshua's audacious prayer for the sun to stand still is because it was a prayer that would bring glory to God. Everything in our lives should bring glory to God. Now, there are a lot of different interpretations about this passage from theologians about what it meant that that Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still. One of, you know, did the sun actually stop in the sky? Did the day actually extend longer? And why did Joshua pray this very specific prayer? What was it that he was trying to get at? And there's, there's a pretty common interpretation, which might be right, that Joshua wanted more time in his day because he felt like they might lose momentum if the sun set and they had to pick things back up the next day. But if you read the text, it, it seems like that might not be the exact right interpretation for a couple reasons. One, Joshua already knew that he was going to win this battle. God had already told him that you're going to win this battle, so why would he be concerned that he was going to run out of time to win the battle? The other thing is the position that he calls for the sun and the moon to stand still in are the positions that they would be in the morning, in the top of the day. Why at the top of the day would Joshua be staying? God, hold the moon and the sun still in these positions so that I can have a longer day at the beginning of the day. It seems like if he was going to pray that prayer, he would pray it at night. Now, in the context, he is fighting against five kingdoms who come and who are serving pagan gods. Common pagan gods were sun and moon gods. And these other five kings would be looking intentionally at what the position, what the allotment of the sun and the moon were going to do to tell them something about whether or not they were going to succeed in that day or, or fail in that day. And they believed that their positioning of the sun and the moon had something to tell them about their power. And instead, Joshua says, God, I want to prove in this moment, not just that we can overcome this battle, I want to prove in this moment that what they are worshiping is not a God at all, but is part of your creation. So if you hold the sun and the moon still in their position, it will send them a message that they are confused, that they are defeated, that they are going to be overcome, and more than that, that the one true living, the Yahweh God, the creator of heaven and earth, is the God who is on our side. Joshua's prayer was not a prayer that he might not have enough time to overcome this battle. Joshua's prayer was a prayer that the name of God would be lifted up, that the name of God would be glorified, that all glory from the battle would come to the one true God. And when he prayed out of a heart of prayer to see the glory and the name of God seen in his moment, seen in his situation, seen in his battle, heaven moved and was drawn to that. 
Our prayers pull on the heart of God when they're prayers that, that bring glory to God. When we say, God, I want you to be exalted in this moment. God, I want you to be glorified in this moment. I want you to be lifted up in this moment right here and right now. And all of heaven stands at attention. And I love it when it says, when it recaps, the thing that it recaps is not that the sun stood still and therefore there was never a day like it. It says that there was never a day like it when God heeded the voice of a human being. When Joshua prayed a prayer so powerful that it caused heaven to turn and to stand in attention. Because the writers of the scripture were not impressed that God could cause the sun and the moon to stand still in the sky because the writers of the scripture understood that he is the creator of all things. Of course, he can cause the sun and the moon to stand still just like Jesus can speak to the wind and the waves and cause them to be still. He is the creator of all things. What was impressive to the writers was that Joshua prayed a powerful prayer that commanded the attention of heaven and caused God to move on his behalf. And remember how Joshua made this bad deal with the Gibeonites. And he put himself in this situation, in this treaty, where he was going to be brought into a battle. But thankfully, we serve a merciful God who was walking that situation out on his behalf because when I was reading it something stood out to me which is that these five kings from these five other territories in the promised land had come up to Gibeon and had attacked Gibeon and that drew Joshua into this battle where he then had to come and overtake them and after the sun stands still and everyone stands in marvel and they overcome this battle, it says that Joshua and the children of Israel then went on to overcome all five of the kings who had come and tried to attack them. And suddenly it occurred to me that even though Joshua made what, a treaty that maybe he shouldn't have made, God turned that moment and caused it to work on Joshua's behalf. And I think how Joshua had to be thinking about the story of his forefather Joseph who said, you meant it for evil, but God turned it for my good. Because in one battle, Joshua received five victories. When he partnered with heaven in a powerful prayer, Joshua all of the sudden found himself in a situation where what would have taken him five separate individual battles overcoming these five lesser kingdoms in the territory, they drew themselves in and put themselves right in a predicament where they tried to come against Joshua and instead Joshua marched one time. Instead Joshua prayed one prayer. Instead Joshua fought one battle and in that one battle, that one prayer, that one march, Joshua was able to overcome five victories. He was able to overcome five kings. He was able to overcome five territories. And I'm believing that as we partner with heaven in powerful prayers, that God is going to put us in a position where we do some kingdom math, some heavenly multiplication. And he says, there's one battle that I have for you, but there's five victories on the other side of it. There's one place that I need you to march to, but there are five territories on the other side of it. If there are people of God who will stand with God and pray some powerful prayers, I believe that over these next three months, as we dedicate the first 10 days, as we speak into our own lives, and as we speak into this place, that God is going to cause us to pray some powerful, specific, action-oriented prayers that are rooted in his word, that are rooted in intent and that we are going to connect with the heart of heaven and cause heaven to stand on attention. Why don't you stand right where you are? I'm going to ask, I have three people who are going to come and help me pray prayers. Because before we leave, we are going to begin to lean our hearts and our minds into what it means to pray powerful prayers. Believing that God is going to do exceedingly abundantly that 2020 is not over, that he has built us for this year, that he has positioned us for this moment, and that we are going to excel in the thing that he has called us to. 
So we're going to pray a couple of things before we leave. We're going to pray that we have ears to hear what God has to say to us. We're going to pray that God would turn what the enemy meant for evil and turn it for good. That there are five-fold victories, that there is a multiplication, that we're going to see some kingdom multiplication happening in this moment. That one battle would give us five victories. Because Matthew 18 says that whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And if that two of us agree, then anything that we ask will be done. For where two or three are gathered, God is there in their midst. Amen? So let's lean in with prayer. If you pray in a, in a um, spiritual tongue, why don't you go ahead and pray in the spirit right now. If you pray in English, let's partner together in prayer. Father, we thank you that we're partners with you. We thank you that we're co-laborers together with you. We thank you, Lord God, that you called us for, at such a time as this. We thank you for victories that you've assigned to us, to your church, to your people, Lord God, in the land. We thank you that you'll use us to multiply victories, oh God. One battle, five victories, five overcoming. Thank you, Lord God, that we're your weapons. We're your weapons with ears and we're your weapons with eyes. Father, we, we make a covenant with you with our eyes, Lord God, that we would see things, Lord God, that you would see. We'd see your glory. We'd see how you would want us to walk through a matter, oh God. We thank you, Lord God, that we make a covenant with our ears, that we would hear what thus saith the Lord. We would hear your instructions. We would hear what you would say to us about a matter, Lord God. We would be flexible, Lord God, in our hearing. And we'd be flexible, oh God, in our seeing. We thank you, Lord God, that we will not resist you. We will not resist truth, the truth that we see, but we will work with you, Lord God. We would flow with you. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that we're after your glory. We thank you that we're teachable. We thank you, Lord God, that our eyes are learning to see what you want us to see. Our eye gates, oh God, are open. We thank you, Lord God, that we're not blind. We're not a myopic. We're not just seeing a certain thing narrowly. But Father, we're thinking broadly. We're seeing broadly, oh God. We're not deaf. Oh God, we're not, we're not stuck in our place, oh God. We're thinking or hearing according to our own filters. But Father, we're open to you and we're open to what your voice says and to our spirit, oh God. We're alive, oh God. We're alive to your truth. You're al we're alive to your direction. We're alive, Lord God, to your, to your victory. You said that you always cause us to triumph in Christ Jesus. So Father, we just bless you and we thank you for seeing eyes and for hearing ears. In the name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you for being God over every area of our lives, God. We thank you, Father God, for your faithfulness, Father God, for your covering, Father God, for your love, Father God, for your strength, Father God, for being the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore, God. We believe you today, God, in our homes, God, in our finances, God, in our marriages, God, as we go to work, God. We believe you, God, that you can make changes in our homes, God, changes in every area of our lives, God, just as you did as Joshua prayed to you, Father God. With one battle, Father God, he received five victories, God. We're praying for victory, God. Victory over every area, God. Victory in our homes, God. Victory over our minds, God. Victory over addictions, God. And victory, Father God, over racism, God. Victory in our churches, God. We know you have all power, and we believe you, God. And we thank you, God, for doing it. We thank you for making a way. We thank you for being faithful. We thank you for who you are, who you have always been, and who you will always be. And we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Father, we, we just thank you today, Father, as we roll out of 2020 and we roll into 2021, that your name is higher than everything we face. Your name is higher than anything we face, Father. As Pastor Meredith quoted scripture, whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, Lord. And today, we come against the spirit of violence and we say that God is able to turn it around. We come against the spirit of addiction and we say that God is able to turn it around. We come against the spirit of abuse and we say God is able to turn around. Come on, say it with me. We come against every attack on your mind. God is able to turn it around. Every attack against your body, God is able to turn it around. Every attack against your spirit, that God is able to turn it around. Because God is take, able to take whatever the enemy meant for evil and turn it for good. And Father, we say that no weapon formed against you has the ability to prosper, Lord. And going into 2021, at the end of 2020, we say that you will prosper 
in your mind, in your soul, in your body. We say that every, every good thing will come your way. Entering the next year, Lord, we say no attack of the enemy has the ability to pray, to, to take over your mind, spirit, or body. And we say that the goodness of the Lord shall follow you wherever you go. And for that, we give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory in Jesus' name. Yes, God. And God, I pray for us, your people, that you would give us a new boldness, God, that you would give us a new faith, that you would give us a new strength, God, a new belief to partner with you in prayer, God, that we wouldn't pray small prayers, but that we would pray prayers in light of your bigness, God, that we would pray prayers that are in light of who you are, the creator of heaven and earth, the omniscient, all-powerful, mighty God, that we would say there is nothing outside your reach, God. There is nothing that is too far gone for you. There is no sickness, God, that doesn't come under your name, that we would pray prayers, God, that partner with you, God, from our integrity, from your word, Father God, that we would put our hands in action, that we would see you move. God, I thank you that you are setting us up for moments where a single battle will give us multiple victories, oh God, and that you are turning what the enemy has meant for evil, and you are turning it into your good. And God, your word says that the prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. So I thank you for a flood of righteousness, oh God. I thank you for people that have been sanctified in your blood. And we cry out for a whole new group of people who are coming home to the family of God. God, we cry out for salvations in this season, that the number of those who can count themselves righteous would increase God, would increase God. We declare that there are those who are coming to know you for the first time. We declare that the prodigals are coming home. We declare that we would see many baptized, declaring that you are the God who has made them new, Father God. We cry out, God, that as we dedicate this time to you, that we would find ourselves in your presence. Oh, let your name be glorified. Let your name be lifted up. God, let your name be exalted in all that we do. Come on, in all the people of God who are in agreement, said amen, amen, and amen. Yes. We are believing that that word will bring strength and hope into your life. Absolutely. If God just spoke to you through this message and you're stirred right now to partner with us and to sow financially into the ministry that is Cornerstone Church, I want to encourage you to jump on over to our website, which is simply cornerstone.church and click the give button. Find the avenue that is most convenient for you today. That's right. We are going to continue spreading the message of the gospel and we look forward to continuing to connect together.